Hi, good evening everyone. Allison Scobberg here. Um, oftentimes you probably see me as the owner of Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, it's true, I serve uh, as the owner of Consolidated Planning Group, to, but tonight I am here with you as the um, director of Fort Bend County um, ADDASR, the Attention Deficit Disorder Association. Um, I have been leading this group, I don't know, it might be almost 10 years, it's been a while. Um, so I, um, my involvement started with this group a long time ago um, because I myself um, have a child, an adult child now that has ADHD and um, had attended some of the other groups throughout the Houston area and felt like, hey, we need a parent group. We need a, you know, a group for parents and help. There are groups, ADDASR. Uh, the Southern Region, that SR stands for the Southern Region, there is a Facebook group and you guys can join that for free. Um, they've been serving the community since 1987. Our group, um, since COVID, has been meeting online as opposed to in person. We used to meet in person, um, but we have found that this format seems to be a better fit for most families anyway. Um, so each month we get together once a month um, on the last Tuesday of the it is Tuesday, yes, the last Tuesday of the month in general, unless there's a big holiday or something. We generally don't meet during the summer. So this is our um, first meeting um, coming back from summer break. And we are excited um, to be partnering with NAMI Houston and the executive director, Angelina Hudson. She's going to be talking to us um, about uh, the services that NAMI provides. And oftentimes, um, as you know, as a parent, there's often comorbid conditions that go along with ADHD or ADD. So we're going to be talking about some of those uh, tonight. I always like to tell you a little bit about the organization. This organization was founded by Pam Esser. Um, she herself also has uh, an adult um, child with ADHD and she formed this organization and she wanted this organization to be formed without barriers for people to join, meaning that they charge expensive memberships to join uh, and things along those lines. So there are other organizations, but this is specifically and we have chapters all, all throughout the state of Texas. Um, ADDASR has a um, conference and they have great speakers that come in from all across the country. The conference is wonderful, great information. So following this um, webinar tonight, we are in webinar mode, which means that we can't see you or hear you, but we know you're there and we're glad you're here. Um, we want you to not be afraid. You can put your questions in the chat box. You can feel free to put them out there to everyone or you can put your questions just to the host if you don't want somebody to see you know who put the question out there that is completely fine we're not going to be calling anybody out um so we aim to answer your questions tonight following this um webinar probably tomorrow you're going to get an email with a copy of the slides that'll have any the links or any of the things that angelina talks about and it also will have um how you can join the ADA organization it's super cheap i think it's I think it's like $40 a year or something like that to, to uh, join the, the organization. And that gives you access to the conference and um, all of the other um, groups that are around the state. So you might wanna check that out. There are groups for parents. There are groups for adults with ADHD and ADD. There's, there's all kinds of resources. So our group, we meet online. Um, we have a different speaker every month on various topics. And so tonight, we are happy to be partnering with NAMI. NAMI is a wonderful organization and I'm gonna let Angelina um, talk to you about it, tell you a little bit about her story and the services that you can get. There is help. And I think, I, I know that in my household, mental illness, you know, there has been, that has been a real issue. And I know that um, NAMI and their services and, and some of the classes and coursework and things like that they have in the groups, have been wonderful and um, so although a lot of times as a parent um, you feel alone in this journey but you are not alone and so I think that that's what you're going to hear tonight so thank you Angelina for being here with us don't be shy I'm putting your questions in the chat box tonight and we'll get to um, as many as possible and if you're planning your evening we have a hard stop we're going to be done within an hour so um, you can plan your evening dinner whatever you need so thanks so much Angelina I'm going to turn it over to you all right. Well, thank you so much, Allison. Um, and it's an honor to be here tonight, a privilege really to talk to you and share just a little bit of my story and approach um, with raising a child with 
a diagnosis of ADD and ADHD. So we can go to the next slide and jump right in. All right, so a lot of times, um, most people don't see ADHD or ADAD as a type of mental health condition or a type of mental illness, and it is. Mental illnesses, all of them are simply brain disorders. I shouldn't say simply because they can be quite complex, but mental illness is a brain disorder. Not all brain disorders are mental illness, right? You can have a brain disorder and it not be considered psychological. It can have a, a more physical manifestation. But under the umbrella of ADHD, um, it is considered a mental health condition. It is in the DSM. And um, those times in your life that you think you should be having the most celebratory attitude, graduations, weddings, the birth of a new child, all of these things can really upset the apple cart and turn things upside down for either a child or an adult living with ADHD. So I don't want you to always think that something bad has to happen. It doesn't mean that your child has been traumatized, that you've done some sort of neglect, that there's been some tragedy in your life, and now your child has this lifelong chronic whatever. No, even the good stress in life, because all mental health conditions have what they call an underlying predisposition. It's in our genetics, and then an environmental trigger. And that trigger it's just the way our brain handles that stress. So it's not negative and there's nothing to be ashamed of. So I had to learn that through NAMI. So in this particular um, PowerPoint, I'm going to share some of the statistics. So American children under 18 years old, 12% will have a diagnosable disorder. Uh, some say in Texas, that's 25%, but uh, across the country, uh, that's uh, that's 12%. And um, it doesn't mean that uh, you can't have strands and pieces of this, these disorders that you still have to contend with with no diagnosis on the table. So in my case, I have uh, three children and uh, all three of them, bless their hearts and bless mine too, have a diagnosis. So we fell right in the middle of that 12%. Here's what we know. Early detection is critical because that's the time where you can get treatment and you can do something to sort of intervene and educate yourself and prepare yourself for what's coming ahead. But um, most cases, I think 50% are, they show signs and symptoms by age 14. 75% of all adult cases will show signs and symptoms by age 24. So somewhere between 14 and 24, is where we're, we're seeing the most identifiable signs of mental health conditions. All right. So um, the problem with not identifying, so, you know, many times our brain will try to protect itself and say it's not happening. Say it ain't so, Sam, say it ain't so, you know, tell me that this is going to pass. My child is going to outgrow this. But the problem with not reaching out for real medical intervention is that, you know, students 14 and older with mental illness, especially if there's no um, handle on the diagnosis or treatment plan, 50% uh, of those kids drop out of school. And then it leads to isolation and then hanging out with the wrong crowd and doing all the things that you really didn't plan on them doing when they were born. 70% um, of the juvenile justice system uh, those kids have some sort of uh, diagnosable mental health condition. And again, these stats are usually uh, the grim case for families who have not find a way, found a way to get a diagnosis or um, find an appropriate treatment plan. One thing that you said that I have a question on, Angelina, like you said like 14 to 24, and I'm just thinking of that perfect storm, those adolescent years, those teenage years that are, you know, I call it... <clears throat> At my house, I called it TTB, typical teenage behavior, and then um, and then I called it TTB on steroids. Um, so, like when we have a kid that it, you know, maybe is ADHD, learns a little different, you know, neurodiverse, that those those stressful years that are stressful for all families, it was just kind of like amped up, and so it's in when I think about brains and brains being fully formed, quote unquote, at age twenty six is what they say, right? But right. a lot of our kids that are ADHD or on the autism spectrum, 
they're the behind that time frame. They're so they might be they may be three to five years behind from that maturity level. So I think that those numbers of 14 to 24 are very, very interesting. Yeah, that is the the signs where they say it's most easy to see that these uh symptoms are not typical. But I will say that our kiddos, all of them with brain disorders, are three to five behind three to five years behind the curveball in terms of maturity, in terms of being able to get a real defined prefrontal cortex where they have uh, executive function that is what they consider typical. They seem to make um poor judgment uh they, they seem to be behind in terms of their full blossom, but, but the ADHD behaviors are not, are not behind apparently. So there's three type, types of ADHD. And I don't know if that slide is here. So I'm going to say it here. The first type is the inactive, uh, inattentive type, uh, not inactive, just inattentive. Meaning um, sometimes you may have a child that they call a, a you know, spaced out or aloof or um, uh, my daughter's nickname, especially in middle school, the teachers called her the little fairy. They said she was always just off in the distance, um, not necessarily tuned in uh, to what people were saying. Um, in her earlier years in elementary school, uh, before she was diagnosed, we were lovingly calling her Libby two times because everything we said, we had to say twice, everything, uh, to the extent where we would say, look in my eyes, now repeat after, what did I just tell you? You know, we, we thought, we didn't know what to think, but we didn't think it was diagnosable until school officials, teachers, administrators, they said, you know what, we need to get her tested. And boy, the whole, my whole heart broke when I heard that, but, um, but I- Knowledge but, is power. Yeah. You know, oh. I think, I, I think oh. that that is, as part of it is learning what it is and what it's not. So that way you can kind of adjust and, and have a plan. And then I think one thing that you said that I think about that I had to remind myself a lot in these adolescent years, look, you're looking at your kid and they look the age, but when they're three to five years behind, having realistic expectations for these kids that are three to five years behind from a maturity level, even though they look the part, um, that's the hard part as a parent. So, but it is important that we keep that oh. in mind because sometimes I, I can say for me as a parent, sometimes I had unrealistic expectations because yes. I was thinking you were quote unquote this many years old, or you should be able to do sure. your homework independently, or you should whatever. But they, but my expectations were skewed. They were wrong. Is what they were, mm -hmm. and um, and and probably unnecessary stress um, on on the kid as well. So I think adjusting sure. that and thinking about the maturity definitely matters. And it breaks down the stigma. The earlier that you can get over your stigma, shame, blame, and guilt, the earlier that you can have a just matter of fact conversation about it with your kid, put them in the driver's seat of what recovery looks like for them, how are they going to maintain, um, and have these just real matter of fact conversations conversations without condemnation so that they have a resilience. They have a way that they can come back and make things right because regular children with no ADHD and no ADD mess up. They do things that are impulsive. Everybody has a bad day or a bad period of time, but our kiddos with ADHD and ADD, you know, sometimes correction, authority, uh, the rules, that kind of thing. It, either they're going to, um, I call it implode, which means shut down which is your 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 ADHD inattentive type, or they're going to explode, which is your ADD uh, hyperactive type. Then there's a third type of ADHD, which is combined. When you have a, a child that is both inattentive and hyperactive, believe me, the two can coexist. I call him my Yahoo. And um, you don't really outgrow this condition. You can you can get better. You can have better coping skills. You know, it could change over time. But 70%, and this could be my next slide, but 70% of children with um, ADHD go on to have a secondary diagnosis. And so that's something to be very cognizant of because um, I was always watchful to see if there was going to be another diagnosis. In the case of my daughter who has ADHD, the inattentive type, 
what we learned is that the anxiety was already there. So the general anxiety, it doesn't become a disorder, like something that really has to have strong, you know, medical intervention, unless it's keeping them from going to school, or they can't hold a job, or they can't take care of their daily function, or um, they can't enjoy any satisfying relationships. So it's very funny, the kiddo with the inattentive ADHD didn't have any friends, never wanted a cell phone because she wasn't going to answer the phone anyway. Um, now she's all into scrolling, but she still doesn't use the phone function because she doesn't need a lot of people in her world. And so I'm always careful not to crush her ability to think outside the box because she would rather just stay at home and stay in the bed and never live, you know? So, I mean, never live outside the house. And so, but the Yahoo is totally different. Um, he's 23 now, and we just informed him that we're going to do something different with our original homestead. So he's going to have to move. And now he's decided I'll just live in my car and get a job where I travel all over the world. And I'm not even going to have a home. And I'm thinking that's a bit extreme. And so, uh, you know, it's always trying to manage and, and make sure that you're not triggering them or at least that they're aware of their own triggers so they can they can look for their supports. Um, I, I used to use the, the 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 term of trying not to crush their spirit, and you just yeah. use that word, the crush, try to not to clip their wings, crush their clip spirit, their or, yeah. you know, whatever whatever that might be. But you said something a while ago, and it's big: blame, shame, and guilt. And that is a big thing. And I think that there is this stigma, and there's this shame, this this quietness, like. Um, people are suffering alone in their own homes um, and they don't know where to get help. They're embarrassed to talk about this. Their other friends post all these wonderful pictures on Facebook and, you know, um, how how great their kid is at Harvard or whatever is going on. Getting married, um, just had twins, yes, bought their first and, home. And, but I think, um, I think that the stigma that is tied to it, it, it's, um, it is a big deal. And I think I, I want to make sure that you, you know, touch on that. So, sure. so you, you brought it up earlier when you said there should be a group for parents. So the group that I found for parents was uh, NAMI. And the way I found that group was I went to um, a school because the art committee or the 504 committee, whichever way you're going with your intervention at the school level. Um, and I learned about that. I went to a a a conference and that's the very first thing that i did when i found out that i was dealing with kiddos with brain disorder and not just one at first it was two right and the reason i was so devastated Al allison and everybody on this call is because i just had a child diagnosed with a brain tumor so i didn't want to hear that there was anything wrong with perfect olivia perfect in every way because i was already dealing with another kid and it turns out he didn't have a brain tumor, so that's good. Um, his diagnosis was later autism, but wow, brain tumor to autism. But the schools didn't give me a lot of information on how, what to ask for, what can I expect. So there's this guy named Peter Wright, and he had this, this um, book, from emotions to advocacy, because I learned very quickly, I had to learn how to stop crying, and I had to learn how to advocate for my kids. This particular slide is very um, um, serious. It deals with suicide. And so, you know, there, you know, people, who, the kids and adults who deal with mental health conditions and are depressed and anxious, especially as their mood goes down, the risk becomes uh, a threat. And so that is something that you have to pay attention to because when we talk about crushing their spirit and making them think that they can't do anything right and, and they can. So, um, everything I learned in autism it, uh, and behavior related to autism, it helped me with ADHD. And what I mean by that is this kiddo that was diagnosed with a brain tumor and turned out to be autism, he didn't talk for seven years. So they sent the entire family to sign language school and we all learned how to interpret and how to sign so that we could communicate with this kid who wasn't talking. But I learned that everything we did for the kid with autism worked with the kid with ADHD. So I learned how to yell and I learned how to be angry and I learned how to say stop and put your feet down because he was always had his feet in my seat. I could do it in sign language and he would comply. But if I used my voice, if I used, he would get upset. 
and throw a tantrum and throw chairs across the room and all that. And I'm like, whoa. So I started using, for autism, I used visual uh, schedules. Um, we had a routine. We had a morning routine. We had an evening routine. We even had a holiday routine. So the school forces you into a routine during the school year. But I learned that having a very structured environment at home reduced all of the unwanted behavior from the kiddo in autism and the kiddo with ADHD. So everything we did for a autism was actually very, very helpful and functional for ADHD. Um, and I soon found out about Ada. I met Pam Esser with uh, ADASR in Houston. I lived in Humble, so Kingwood was very close to me. I learned that um, in order to train a child how to modulate their emotions and their social skills and their social emotional development, I had to modify mine. So it was a big eye opener. And I would recommend just turn into a sponge and learn everything you can about the diagnosis, uh, the people who survived the diagnosis. I read every book written by an adult that was written uh, by adults with autism and ADHD. But ADHD was just as significant a diagnosis as autism ever could have been. And um, I did two things that I would highly recommend. One is I got a full neurological makeup. Tell me you don't have insurance. Tell me you don't have enough money for it. I didn't either at the time. So guess what I did? I drove my little boy over to Bentob Hospital, which is a public hospital. I went to the information desk. I didn't know where to go. I said, I need to find the neurological department, the neurology department. They said, what? I said, I need my son tested. I needed the neuro neurology department. And they said, okay, go to this floor. I went to that floor and they looked at me like, why do you need? I said, I don't have a primary care provider. I have a kid that's about to get kicked out of school because of whatever they were telling me. Um, and I need, I need his neurology to be tested because he has a brother with autism. So I need him tested because something's going on. Do you know how long I waited on the wait list? If I had had insurance, the wait list was one year. I didn't have insurance. My wait list was three months. And when it came time for him to do his full battery of tests, which were like eight hours worth of testing, uh, the doctor that walked in the room was the same doctor that had served my oldest son when I was insured. I'm insured now, but, you know, life happens. Um, the same specialist and neuro pediatric neurologist that saw my son when I was fully insured at Texas Children was the same neurologist that walked in the door <laughs> five years later to test my younger son. And I was like, what are you doing here? And you know what he said? It's a teaching hospital. And we lend our time from Texas children to come here and teach the physicians here on how to read this and do that and everything. And so I had the same type of team at Bentop that I had. So there's really no reason why you can't get the support that you that you that you need. And I would and also just like to mention that sometimes testing, if your child is enrolled in vocational rehab, VR. Um, they do a lot of testing. They do that neuropsych testing. They do the vocational evaluation and it's covered by VR. So that's another door you could walk through. They have to be over to 14, drop. I think, right? Yeah, four, yeah 14 it starts at age 14. Mm -hmm. um, that is correct for that. So I think that that um, is truly important. And one thing that I was thinking about is, you know, our kids that are neurodiverse, whether they have ADD, ADHD, autism, whatever, they're just neurodiverse. Um, the, that support and getting as a parent getting the support that you need to be able to support the child that is sometimes difficult and i'm not using that i know it's just hard to support they don't come with a manual you don't you know mm -hmm. like you know and and you don't always know what to do but getting the support you need as a parent the thing is is with these kids and the the importance of not clipping their you know, wings or crushing their spirit. Their spirit is crushed every single day at school. Anyway, they are already <laughs> our kids that are ADHD 
or have um, learning disabilities already know. They, they, mm -hmm. their, their peers tell them all about themselves. And so they already feel bad. They already know what they're not they doing. They feel like they don't fit. Right. No they, matter what you say, no matter, they can be captain of the football team. They can win the winning touchdown or make the final shot that won the game. And I remember getting back in the car. I'm like, you really did great. And he would say, but I didn't do X, Y, Z. So it didn't even matter. Right. They beat themselves up quite a bit. I just wanted to add what the testing does for you. When you get the, a full testing of the brain, MRI, PET scan, neur neurological makeup, sensory integration test, what, what all the tests you do in the brain, guess what you find out? And this is almost 100%. I've been with NAMI for 24 years. The, that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And I run support groups and I talk to parents all the time. So this is anecdotal. I don't have, I'm not a researcher. But most of the time when you have any type of mental illness on board, such as ADHD or ADD, guess what? There's something going on with one of the processes of the brain in addition to the ADHD. They're going to have either a visual processing disorder. So this one has um, a skyoptic processing, a visual processing disorder called the Erlene syndrome. And it's pretty severe. It is so severe that he was on grade level with reading. And he was three and four and five grades ahead, especially in science and math. He was making perfect scores on the, on the state exam. So... Why was he on grade level with reading? That's because the letters on the page were making rivers and waterfalls and he couldn't read under a certain type of light. And he was relying on his auditory learning and just faking it and all of his, or cheating and all of his spelling test and, and English lit and all of that. And so finding out my daughter who has ADD has auditory processing disorder, which is why we called her Livy two times. So they took her to a special school to test her hearing. And to my sadness, she could hear just fine. And I'm like, well, then what's wrong? I knew it was the brain. I knew it. And so when they, when they went to, to test her, her brain waves through this test where they put you to sleep, they sedate you. Now these kids were tested. My, listen, my, my youngest son, we knew something was wrong at seven months. It was four years before he got the first diagnosis. He was four years old. The next one was six years old. She was only in school one full year when they said, oh no, Houston, we have a problem. So I've, I've learned with ADHD and ADD, either you're going to see it right away at like four five and six years old when they're in school and you can compare them to other students in their development. Or like Alan with Allison was saying, you're going to find out that they skated through. They somehow they were adorable, precocious, and had high aptitude in, in elementary school. But by the time they get to middle school and high school, and the and the and the curriculum is tougher. You know, there's a lot of inference, and there's no tolerance for impulsivity and that sort of thing. And then don't say it, but. I mean, don't even think it, but that's also when the drugs become, you know, uh, kids start experimenting, you know, in middle school and high school. And so with all of those outside factors, if it's going to show up, it's going to show up around middle school, high school, and you can get, you can get testing then as well. But again, so the earlier, the better. The neuropsych testing is what she's talking about. And I just want to clarify that because you know, a lot of your kids may have gone through an ARD process. They might have an IEP and you say, well, the school's done testing. The school doesn't do neuropsych testing. You know, they might do learning disability testing. They may do IQ testing and they'll do some other things, but they're really not doing the neuropsych testing. The neropsych testing is much more comprehensive. This is where, and, and this yeah. is where you can ask somebody in the chat box said parents, you know, stand on what you know about your child. Um, but you can ask, you know, for specific batteries. I want them to be tested for ADHD. I want them to be tested for autism. Um, you know, maybe it's borderline personality disorder. Maybe it's bipolar. There's so much alphabet soup out there. We love initials when it comes to mental illness. But asking for those specific um, those tests and the neuropsych um, testing, I think that it is important. And it's not so much to me, Angelina, the label, like we all no. need labels. We want to label no. everything. It's what you're dealing with. It's how, what are you dealing with and what is the best path forward mm -hmm. um, to, to get, it's not fixing. We're not fixing your kid. We're not trying to fix your kid. They're wonderful. But 
how can we give them the tools and resources that they need to be successful in their own life and their definition of success? with what we're dealing with it is and what are you it is. willing to do and what are they willing to do every kid is different they're not all going to follow the same protocols or treatment options or coping strategies they're all going to find their own way what do i have on that next slide allison and yes and one thing i wanted to mention is like you know i think when it comes to a point like some things have come to a head for families and they may have had a hospitalization, they may have had a psych hold, they may have had a hospitalization, or these quick 48 hour, 24 hour holds, and then they release them, but nothing's changed. And then it's so, so difficult, Angelina, to find residential treatment if that's necessary, outpatient. Oh, sure. There, some of these things that they throw around in the mental health area is, you know, intensive IOP, intensive outpatient therapy. They'll call it PHP, partial hospitalization therapy. Sure. And mm -hmm. then there's RTC, you know, residential there's treatment um, centers. Treatment. Yeah. So, so, you know, finding that, I think that's kind of this shot in the dark. It's so hard to find services when something has escalated to that point where, hey, this is more than what a, you know, 50 minute uh, psychology appointment can handle. So I want you to talk to us about that too. Sure. Sure. So, so thankfully, uh, in, in my personal case, we never escalated, but we very easily could have because the triggers were multiple. And as he got older, um, you know, there were outside influences. And, and so what, whenever, when everything started to go high, I got I got low. And in my case, not being a single parent, I was able to stop working for a while and just really be accountable. And then thank God I got this job with NAMI. And I remember the office was two blocks from the school so I could go every day. If I got, if I got a phone call from him and he said, I'm going to jail today. Well, I was standing right next to him, you know, three minutes late. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, one of the tests that we haven't mentioned, Allison, that you can get through the school district for absolutely free is a functional behavior assessment. And that's where an LSSP or some of the licensed uh, psychologists will follow your child around both at home, at school, and in the community to see how they respond to stimuli. And and how they regroup and how they, you know, how they control their behavior. And then they'll come meet with you and say, okay, the best time your kid is behaving and resp responding in a, you know, neurotypical way is when he's here or he, so at different times of their life, my kids would be better at school than they were at home or better at home than they were at school, but they take their strengths. It's a strength-based assessment. And they say, okay, this is what we're going to do to try to improve their behavior. But you have to ask for this functional behavior assessment, especially if it's the hyperactive impulsive type of ADHD, because behavior is going to be a problem. If it's not a problem already, it will be. And you hear these stories where, like you were saying, Allison, they escalate the type of treatment. Um, I remember for the one, one of my kids, they wanted to put him in a back classroom where it was the most intensively secure don't see the light of day classroom and I said why and so when they when they told me why I said but is that based what is that based on it was just based on their idea of that would be easier for them and I said no I need a functional behavior assessment so when you have an FBA done a functional behavior assessment there has to be an agreement between the family and the school on the BIP, that's the behavior intervention plan. So here's what I want you to know that NAMI says all the time. It is not what you do when a crisis happens. It's how you're prepared for the crisis that's going to happen. So you know it's going to happen. So you want to be prepared. And I made sure that calling the police was nowhere on my BIP, especially not if, if you've not called the parent. So uh, so we always got into agreements with the school district. Now, the only issue there is sometimes whoever responded to the behavior didn't know about the BIP. So then I, I went to another class called, um, it was family to family network. They had a class called, um, student portfolio. 
developing a student portfolio. And so every summer I created a student portfolio for the next year and I educated everybody that was going to talk to my child. And then I asked them, could I come in and do the presentation? I don't, I didn't need help. I, you know, so, or I would, I would put something together very, you know, down and dirty that they just had to read. But navigating how far to go with your kid really is based on one fundamental decision. And I have narrowed it down to one thing. And that is, as a parent, you have to decide what are you going to do? Listen, when I stopped working for those years, we couldn't get a new car. We had, to, we had to leave our beautiful home that we had. I mean, we had to make some other financial decisions that were pretty tough just so that we wouldn't lose our son to the system. You know what I'm saying? And so- we made those decisions. So a part of deciding who you're going to put on the team to help you raise your children, a part of that is what are you willing to do? Everybody doesn't have to stop working, but you do have to decide who's going to help you at your church, who's going to help you in the in the community, who's going to help you. So I recruited members of the team to partner with me and my husband to raise these children at a very early age. And the next two bullets... So poor functioning in school, they fall behind, always being the center of crit criticism and ridicule and rejection. Even if it's not real, sometimes it's just in their head. And then the last thing, which you don't want, is um, them getting kicked out of stuff, kicked out of, I, my son was kicked out of three schools. So, you know, kicked out of programs, kicked out of clubs, kicked out of sports activities. So to avoid these things from happening, Education is critical. And what I mean by education is really two things. The education of the illness itself, the prognosis and what it looks like when it goes well. <laughs> and then educating yourself on just who you are. What are you willing to do as a family? We would sit down in a circle and have a family meeting. Um, if he ever got a bad report, a bad report card, a note home, a suspension, oh, honey, we did it all. Um, any of that, I would say don't react to it. Bring it home and let's just sit down as a family and decide whether we thought that was right or wrong. So we took away the word right or wrong and we replaced it with the word inappropriate. So some things are appropriate in certain settings. And then we just, because somehow the siblings could talk to my son with the most severe case of ADHD. They could talk to him and reason with him in ways he couldn't hear my voice at all. Remember, I'm the signer. So you have to just find out as a family what's going to work with you with the information available. I just wanted to say that as a family, we went through DBT therapy. And, yes. and that is, so you just said like, appropriate or inappropriate is you know it's it's gray black white gray okay it's it's being able to be in the gray area it's being able to talk to your child when they've done something inappropriate and being in the gray area and listening to them it's not condoning it it's not condoning it. It, right. it, it is you know validating their feelings and so the validation it was a lot we we did a lot of training on that and it was i have to tell you it was good um and it's good in life in general not just you know kids that you know may struggle but the dbt therapy there are there are programs where you can do it as a family so you can learn how to more effectively communicate through meltdowns and some of the things that might be happening and so i am definitely um i am definitely a fan of that yeah i i learned about i went to this group for borderline personality this is these are the three yahoos when they were young and you would look at them and think, oh, they look so well behaved because they're clean and they they smile on command. Um, but no, they they I thought we talked about it today with one of my new employees. He used to work for um, the development of the Miniger Clinic. And so he was a part of the team that dismantled uh, Spring Shadows Glen to build Miniger. And um, at this age, those spring shadow glen commercials were coming on the on the tv and i thought wow i could give these three away and i could go check in the spring shadows glen <laughs> because i didn't think i could do it and so um the 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 here's the progression of the journey i went to an elementary school in fort Bend and met this wonderful couple called michael well this was the absolute beginning the the whole getting the diagnosis and looking at the brain scans and the picture of monet is the picture that was on the wall above 
the computer screen. So there I was looking at my son's brain and they're trying to explain to me what's going on and I'm not hearing it because all I know is that he has a brain disorder and I can't fix it. That's all I could hear. I can't fix it. And there's nothing I can do. If you go to the next slide, um, the art committee at the at the school was asking me what did I want? I didn't I didn't know what I wanted. So I went traveling to different schools. I went to Lantern Lane just on a whim and met this wonderful angel by the name of Michael Biasini. And he and his wife volunteered for NAMI. And they told me about this class called Visions for Tomorrow, which is now called NAMI Basics. And I went to this class and you don't have to read. They read to you, thank God, because I was crying the whole time. And 22 other parents were in the room and they were explaining to us what had happened to us. And it was a trauma. It was a trauma to our family that we had given birth to this little child with these little dimples and 10 fingers and 10 toes. And we thought he was going to be this or that, only to find out at age three, what in the world did we have this child who seems to be devil spawn? You know, he was so difficult, but uh, he was difficult. And then he was also very sweet at the same time. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And we didn't know how he was going to make it in life. And so the impact of the mental health condition impacted the whole family. It, it impacted all of us. So all of us needed help and we all had to be educated. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Oh, goodness, I did some movement in here. I'm sorry. Um, the classes that I that I attended um, taught us the importance of taking care of ourselves, knowing how to develop our own social emotional skills, um, how to prepare for crisis situations, how to advocate for their rights, um, what kind of resources to navigate. So NAMI is not a one stop shop. It's more of a clearinghouse. NAMI is who introduced me to ADA. NAMI is who introduced me to Family to Family Network. And then in addition to that, I was going to conferences like Learning in the Brain. Um, there was another conference, um, CHAD, which is the state organization for ADD. I went and in that particular conference, I learned about the medications. Guess what? So I put my son on medication. We tried three different medications and he just got more depressed or he started having some other symptoms for another diagnosis. So I would take him off the medication and it turns out that he had a really hard time metabolizing the medication, but it was really due to the diet he had. And as an adult, he changed his diet and now he's, 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 he can sleep and all that stuff, but it's just a, a science experiment. If your child had any other physical diagnosis like diabetes, type one diabetes, if your child had any other kind of, you would find out everything you could about the diagnosis. You would try to commiserate with other families going through the same thing and help build a life for your child that he could be proud of. You do the same thing with brain disorder. It's the same thing. The only difference is there's more stigma involved because people look at your child's age and they go, oh, they should know better. You know, and uh, uh, it says here, wonder about that. Where's help for that without long procedures? So I I recognize that it had to be multimodal. The intervention I did rely on the doctors. I did rely. My best friends in the school district was the occupational therapist, who is the master of behavior, by the way, um, the behavior consultant. All school districts have a behavior consultant. Just Find someone who's going to tell you who that is and then call them on their private line. You know, I just call them directly. I, I must have really driven the schools crazy because I wouldn't stop. You know, I would keep going until I found who the advocate was at that school for that child that year. Because, you know, every school year, teachers and stuff are different. And I remember one year there was one librarian that really took a special interest in my son and anytime he got in trouble, he could go sit in the library on the couch and just breathe. And so then guess what we did? We wrote that into his behavior intervention plan, that if he got so triggered by whatever was triggering him, as long as he went there and nowhere else, he could walk out the class and he could go sit in the library on the couch. And so you just have to get everybody on your team that's going to work with you. It's Some turning the knobs not, and, and you know, tweaking and, and, and backing up and starting over again. Yep. And one thing that I like to mention to people on the mental health, I wish this was the law in the United States. It's not, 
but there is something called gene site testing, um, G E N E S I T E site testing. And basically it's an oral swab and they will test every, every mental health medicine, any mood stabilizers, um, ADHD meds. And, and when she was talking about her son not metabolizing properly, it's gonna, it, it, you only have to do it once. Insurance usually covers it. And it basically red light, green light, yellow lights, various meds that might be effective for your child. So they're a good place to start. I, I'm a fan of getting that done. At least you can maybe eliminate any of the ones that are on the red list, uh, not to try those because it's probably going to be disastrous. But so I, I am a fan of, if medicine is the route and we're not for or against or anything like that. Um, and it is, um, I would call the medicine a perfect storm because what might work for six years, then they hit adolescent and it doesn't work anymore. Um, and, you know, they, they change their diet and it doesn't work anymore. So, you know, working with a true professional on that um, is important. But most psychiatrists or psychologists office, if you ask for the um, that testing, um, they can do it through their office, file it through insurance. Yep. That's, and, and maybe some of even your primary care physicians might be able to do it uh, as well. Right. I found one place in Houston that does it. It's called... Um biogenetics and um they encourage you to go to your in your php your primary care pcp your primary care provider and ask for the testing to be done and then it's it's just billed to your insurance but i think their cash price is like four or five hundred dollars but to get a yellow green and red light on what because it doesn't make any sense to buy medication and give it to your child with side effects and it's not even going to metabolize well and some of the some of the side effects could be serious could be su su suicidal ideation or some of the other things could make them more depressed or more anxious or not be able to find and there's a lot of different things and so to me, I think it's money well spent. It's okay that medicine might be necessary, but let's try our best to get the, 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 the best ones first and the most appropriate. And what might be the gold standard in the US that they peddle to all of the teenagers might not be what your teenager needs at all. Correct. And so I think it's really important. Someone says I worked in Fort, Fort Bend ISD as well as a site coordinator and had one student that this worked for. Before misbehaving, he would catch himself and walk straight to our office to talk and cool down. We taught him um, the world overstimulated instead of saying his brain hurts. Right, right. So, you, you know what? And that, to me, that's a classic example of an advocate on the school for that particular student. <laughs> Unfortunately for my son, it was the ISS instructor. So he would go to the counselor and ask for a week of ISS in school suspension. But he loved in school suspension because he could work independently. NAMI believes and supports the biopsychosocial approach. The biopsychosocial, bio meaning get your diagnosis, find out what it is. I have one kid who takes her medicine religiously and guess what? It erases her auditory processing disorder. It just totally goes away. The other kid is like, I'm not, nothing's wrong with me. God doesn't make junk and I'm not taking any medicine. So then we had to work with him and say, okay, then what are you going to do? Right? Because let me tell you what another little saying Nami has. It's your mental health condition will explain your behavior, but it won't always excuse it. So for the behaviors that it will not excuse, what are you going to do? And we put him back in the driver's seat of his own decisions. At the social, find your people. Find the people who are not going to blame you, shame you, guilt trip you. Sometimes that's not family. <laughs> Sometimes you have to find an artificial support network for you and your kiddo and you know and so and then psychological understand the impacts you know not only the impacts this is having on that kid that individual but the entire family and try to make it work for you know best you can for everyone uh in my case they're in their 20s now and they can't live together so i've got one over here one over there one over there. The, the uh the number one class in most of all of nami programming trains us about the predictable stage, stages of emotional reaction let me tell you why this is so critical if you don't have control of you, you can't help anyone else. It's almost like that airplane story about put your oxygen mask on first and then give it to the person next to you, your kid or whoever you're caring for. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you know, emotionally, physically, mentally, if you don't do that, then you won't have the stamina. 
You won't have the courage. You won't have the wherewithal to do what you're going to have to do. So they train us about these three stages and how because the illnesses are chronic in the mental health world, then guess what? You cycle through these stages. You may, your kid has been doing well for the last six years. And then you see a Facebook post where his first cousin, same age, just uh, moved to Florida, bought a house and has this great engineering uh, career. And you know, your kid is intelligent, but they don't have the emotional uh, quotient to do some of the same things. And so sometimes it could feel like a disappointment. It can feel like a heartbreak all over again. Right. And so then what do you do with that? You don't ignore it because if you ignore it and stuff it down, then eventually it's going to bite you. Right. So you deal with it. And so learning how to how to master your own emotional journey. And let's say you have more than one. I have three kids diagnosed. That's why I'm at work doing this webinar. <laughs> I didn't dare go home. So, uh, and I have a new grandbaby. So that would have been too much for me. So you just have to know yourself. All right, we can go to the next one. Um, so 13% of you, let me just tell you about these percentages. And, and, and the thing, one of the percentages, I mean, one of the factoids on here, it takes treatment, most people to get in treatment eight to 10 years. Isn't that horrible? That's just stigma and shame and don't want to deal with it. And it's understandable and it's predictable. A lot of families go through. Have you ever heard someone say Joe died and the person goes, no, they heard you. You said Joe died and they said, no, that's the brain automatic shutdown. When we get bad news, they're like, oh no, I'm not dealing with that. You know? And so it's not wrong. It just is being aware of it is key. And these statistics that I've learned don't really matter if the illness comes to your house, if the diagnosis comes to you. And just like Allison said earlier, it doesn't matter what the diag. what really matters instead of the diagnosis, what really matters is how we respond to the, to the signs and symptoms that come up, that trip up your child's life and the, the harmony in your household. That's what you're dealing with. And you can't do it alone. If you do it alone, you're more likely to burn out and you're working in this microcosm of the limitations of your own understanding. Getting out there, talking to other people, looking at organizations that pay attention to ADHD and ADD, you know, conferences about the brain, things like that, learning that you're not alone. Group healing comes in a group setting. So uh, get out your house and get out your brain and, um, uh, we talked about dropping out and suicide and all of that going up with these illnesses, but partnering with the school, partnering with your partner. I remember one at one point I wanted to leave my husband and my whole family because they wouldn't get with the program. But once I learned about the emotional reactions to trauma, I realized they were just in another stage. They were still in stage one and I was already moving to stage two. And the research tells you what you need when you're in each stage. So I was like, y'all, y'all need a, a support group. You need to get educated about the illness um, so that you can move to the next stage because you so, don't want the illness to get more severe or difficult to treat. I, I think part of the issue is, you know, um, access to care. So many of these providers don't take insurance. They charge $200 an hour plus. Um, and then COVID happened and some of these people, A, weren't even taking new patients at all, or if they were, they had a one year waiting list and you got a loved one in crisis with a mental health crisis, they need help right now, not right. a year from now. And so um, tell us about the programs that people can plug into through NAMI, the support groups, and how they can get service, you know, sure, that sure. way. And help that right. Way. If you go to the next slide, I think it's coming up. There's a list. Go to the next one. No, the next one. Sorry. We're running out of time. And I want to share this. This is really critical. When I say don't do it alone, you're like, well, nobody cares. Who am I going to go to? Oh, you would not believe how many people are looking for you. There are nonprofits all over the place, specifically designed. So there's clinical and non-clinical treatments. The ones that you're talking about with the long waist, wait list and the long, you know, there's so much you can do on your own. And I'm the queen of free. I am the queen of free. So um, just a quick example. My son was experimenting with vaping. And then I found out that the vapes had this TCH oil. And that would have sent my child on this downward spiral that I didn't want him to go. So whenever I had to go to work, he was very accustomed to going to work with me because we don't have a choice, right? His dad, where he worked in a pharmacy, he couldn't get off, you know, so we had, he had to go with me. So 
I, I found this wonderful group called um, Compassionate Houston. And every year they have this week of all these different things they do to, to like deal with stress and de-stress and all that. So I took him to the Turkish twir twir twirling dervish. I took him to the chants of the Jew, 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 Jewish women, the Jew, I, I'm not going to say it right. Um, I took him to the, the bowl where you, um, um, hum with this little singing bowl. I did everything with him. And then finally, oh, and we danced under the tree, the Lambeth tree with the Harry Krishners. Yes, I did. I took my African-American 17 year old son and we danced under the tree with these people in these orange suits. And let me tell you, he came to me um, in the, when we were walking to the car and he said, mama, I don't think you're working. He said, I don't think you're working. I said, you're right. I'm not. I told you a story. I, I just told you I had to work, but I really just wanted you to come with me. And he said, why are we doing all these different activities? I said, because all of these people are trying to find peace in their heart. They're, they're unsettled. They're, they're trying to find something in the world that they can hold on to. But guess what they're not doing? They're not smoking, uh, vaping on the pen or whatever. So anything you choose to do, any one of these things we've done, you can do it. Mama don't care but you can't do anything illegal and I don't want you vaping. And he said, you did all of this to show me. I said, so you know what he took up? What he, one of the things he tried that he took up whittling, he started whittling. He likes knives and all that. He started whittling. I'm saying to you, find the non-clinical things you can do as an adult. He's 23. He thinks he's been an adult since he was 18. You know what he started doing? Competing for the Olympics. Isn't that wild? That somebody would go compete with. So he's been going to other countries. I don't know how he's affording this. He's been meeting coaches and he's been Greco wrestling. Greco, because it's 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 physical, it's it's it looks barbaric, and they wear these little itty bitty singlets. That's the name of the uniform. So I learned how to have this approach through NAMI, and this is the principles of support. Um uh when we have a support group. We try to differentiate our, differentiate our issues between two categories, issues for which there's practical, logical, constructive information and resource versus those things which you have no, you have no control. And those things which you have no control, we refer to these principles of support. And we talk about it in a group, you know, like, well, what do you do? And what do you do? Those are the constructive ideas that people come up with. You'd be surprised what people come up with. And those things might work for you. I put in the chat, Dr. Karen Hall. She wrote a book called Validation is Key. When I first heard her talk about that book and validation and DBT and CBT, I said, my son is too clever. He's not going to fall for any of that. I read that book. It's a very small book. Validation is Key. I read that book on the way home. And the first thing I did when I walked in the door is I tried it. I validated it. Oh my gosh, it worked. I said, oh my goodness. So the higher the the amygdala, the amygdala is burning, the more uh off the chain, the more validation is going to work because they're not using their logical side, they're using their emotional side. And validation just, yeah, validation works. And so uh I like the idea that Allison had about DBT, but NAMI, family to family, peer-to-peer -peer basics, and the support groups, they're all using these evidence-based and research-based models, which are um, reviewed medically every two years by the NAMI national team. And so when you get the two and a half inch binder of all the things you probably haven't thought of to do for your kid with any one of these diagnoses, because NAMI doesn't care what the diagnosis is. All they care about is how you're going to make it to a successful life that you're proud of. That's, that's all they're really trying to help families do. So they keep coming up with these new clinical and non-clinical and these therapies that are different that relate to diet and all this stuff and exercise. Um, and so this isn't half. There are so many programs with NAMI. Here's what you got to know. They're free. And now they're creating programs that you can do on demand at home. Like NAMI Basics is on demand. Homefront is on demand. There's another program called Hearts and Minds. And that program focuses on how to deal with your mental health when you also have a physical condition, a physical medical condition as well. So I say, you know, the, the brain is the most powerful thing we have and we don't have to pay for it. You already have one. So what all we have to do is learn more about how to uh, cope with these difficult uh, diagnoses. Go ahead, Alice. So NAMI has um, these types of um, 
courses and groups that meet all across the country, not just in Texas. So if you're listening from somewhere else, 900 affiliates across the country. Yes. And so my understanding is you have in-person meetings, you have online meetings, you have on-demand meetings to meet the person where they are. Some people might not have transportation, so online works. Some people might be shy and they may not want to come in person, but right. some people may learn the best depending on how their brains work. They may learn the best in person. I would say um, for one of my kids, it was really better in person. We tried everything and really uh, better in person, especially for the ADHD kids that are all over the place, like what they have to hone in. And one session, you know, it was better for us. But um, but the bottom line is, is they get, all families can go out to the NAMI website and can find out about groups in their area or across town or across the country. Um, there are other groups out there. And then if a family has, you know, this is, a, it's a big deal and it's emotional and it's you know the stigma and all that stuff so a lot of times people might not necessarily want to put every all, everything out there but if somebody wants to call and reach out directly to you i know we're going to be sending out the slides and the link to the recording and they want some direction or need some direction on you know what may be the first step or should be the first step of connecting with nami for them can they reach out to you yes absolutely I'm putting um, a, a resource in that really turn a page in that ADHD. See, autism is such a big diagnosis that ADHD will sometimes get lost. People think, oh, you just need to grow up or you just need to suck it up. Or you just, you see what I'm saying? Especially boys, you know, the, the world tells them you just need to be a man. Well, he went to this uh, camp, Camp Blessing, and then the older camp is Blessed and Beyond. He didn't go as a camper, y'all. He went as a volunteer. And I don't know why they let him drive a golf cart, but they gave him all these responsibilities and he felt like a hero. And this book, You Are Not Alone, um, it's a it's on Amazon.com. No one makes money for it, the 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 from it. It it the proceeds go to putting on more NAMI programs for free, right? And now there's a second book, You're Not Alone, for parents of children. So there's two books. I'm actually in both books. Oh, now this is, I was trying to say this is them older, but they're not much older there. Uh, but the book, it starts off with the most um, common questions that families ask about mental health conditions. And they're answered by experts from all over the country, all over the world, really. And then the second half of the book is just anecdotal stories. So you can find your scenario somewhere in this book. This book was just created generally, regardless of age. But this year they came out with a second book. I wish I had a picture. I don't. But they came out with it because I haven't bought it yet. They came out with a second book. And that book is for um, uh, parents of children specifically. This is them now. This is this is the group now. Jesus help me. And um, uh, and they're all they're all doing well. They're all working, you know, they're, you know, but it, it, it was a journey. It's been quite a science experiment raising this group of loved ones of mine. And, you have a beautiful uh, family and, well, um, well, and thank such you. an inspiring story that like you had to, um, you had to crawl through the muck to get where you were. It wasn't always easy. It was not a picnic and, um, and, but you came out on the other side. So I think, I know we're out of time for tonight, but I think the the word is is be encouraged. There is help yes. out there for you, and no matter care. And how care. challenging or what you're dealing with. And I know, like I I've um, jokingly called it wheels on the bus, wheels off the bus at my house. Like you know, sometimes <laughs> things are going well, sometimes they're not. Sometimes we're rolling a little bit backwards. Um, but um. But there is help for you. There is support. NAMI is a wonderful organization. And NAMI also has a list of other organizations and other support, um, you know, doors that you can walk through to get the help that you um, that you need if you need some ideas and things like that. So feel free. We are going to get this these slides out to you. Here's that beautiful grandbaby. That's that grandbaby so sweet but feel free to reach out to angela angelina directly i appreciate you guys taking your time to be here with us tonight i hope um i hope that this was um, good for you and somebody um yeah my self-care is spending weekends out of town with my family without with no family 
So, oh, okay. So Self-care is so important, whatever that might be. If it's reading a book or taking a bath or um, getting your nails done or whatever, maybe you, maybe you work out. Um, it is an important, this is the, the, the marathon, not the sprints. And so um, being kind to yourself and bringing yourself um, back to where you need to be so you can be the support for your loved one. Um, that might be struggling is going to be super, super important. So Angelina, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, guys, we're going to send you an email with everything. It's certainly been a pleasure. And um, check out these groups. I have done, I have participated in the groups before, and I thought that they were very helpful. They have informative handouts, like booklets that, I mean, it's not just fluff or just the support mm -hmm. group, but a, a lot of flapping. It was a lot of things that you could take and implement um, with your life and with what you're working through. So I, I, I found them very, very helpful. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Sorry we went over a little bit, but we will definitely catch up next month. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.